Last time I preached on the word holy and how it is the most misunderstood word in the Bible. And I'm going to talk about some problems that came up from last time that I promised to address. And uh, this time I'll build on what we did last time and answer some of these problems. But there are some important things that I won't get time to say today. And so there will be a part three. I don't think there'll be any more than a part three, but that will be the conclusion of this series. So my goal then this morning is to deepen our understanding of this incredibly important word and clear up some misunderstandings. And uh, I've got an introduction and then three parts. So the introduction is how this misunderstanding got in in the first place. And then we're going to look at Moses' failure, holy objects and places, and then the, the expression, a special possession. So first of all, then, as an introduction, let's, let's see how these misunderstandings came about. So the Hebrew word for holy, if you look at the Hebrew scriptures, it's kadosh. And this is written, I've put it in English, English letters there, but it's written in the Hebrew script, kadosh. And uh, a very early translators decided to use an old English word that came from the north, and the, the word um, is uh, hilag, meaning healthy or whole. And that gradually began to, to change the way it was, it was pronounced and spelt until it became to be what we use today um, as, the word, as the word holy. Um, but that didn't really help us understand it because it doesn't obviously doesn't mean that God is healthy. What does it mean? It, and it really wasn't clear what the word meant. And so people started searching for what uh, Kadosh could mean, Kadosh could mean, and they found another ancient word which kind of looked as if it was a bit similar and, and said, well, we know what that other word means. This is going to explain it. And the other word was the word to cut. And so they suggested that if God's holiness has to do with cutting, then it must mean uh, that he's cut off and separate. Now, this turned out to be a bit of a rabbit trail, but quite a few people went down it. Um, so the idea then was that to be holy meant to be separate and to be sort of a cut between us and and other things. And uh, uh, it could be argued that there was a, a gem of truth in this, but it became the basis for a lot of legalism. And so to be holy meant to be different to other people. So the holy woman doesn't wear makeup or the latest fashion. The holy man doesn't wear facial hair, doesn't play um, sports with unbelievers. It, was, it, was, it became a lot of legalism, came out of this idea. And sadly, um, this has become very pervasive as an un idea underlying um, uh, Christian culture. For example, one of the most uh, widely read books on the subject of holiness by R.C. Sproul, it sold uh, almost 200,000 copies. Uh, he says this, and I don't want to be condemning R.C. Sproul. He's done a lot of great work, but I just think in this area, he is mistaken. So he says, the primary meaning of holy is separate. It comes from an ancient word to cut or to separate, which we now know is not true. To translate this basic meaning into contemporary language would be to use a phrase, a cut apart. It points to the infinite distance that separates him from every creature. Turns out that that's actually um, more of a characteristic of Allah in, in Islam than it would be of our God. Um, so as people have studied ancient languages and, and particularly studied the way this word is used in the Bible, which is what we did last time, uh, they've, uh, they've uh, come to the conclusion that a much better way of defining the word when you're talking about God's holiness is his total devotion to his people 
in faithful love and compassion. And last time we saw lots of evidence for this in many, many different places in the Bible. So that's my introduction. And we're going to look now at Moses' failure. And you'll find out why it's relevant. We're going to look at holy objects and places and the problems that come up in that area and then end with a special possession. So Moses' failure. So you may know that Moses was not allowed to lead the people into the promised land. Why was that? And you may know the story. It's about you know, when the people were thirsty and there was a rock and he hit the rock and water came out and God said, you know, you can't lead the people into the land. And the questions always come up for me and probably for you. What did Moses do that was so wrong? Like the previous time he hit the rock and it was OK, but it wasn't all right this time. Like what's going on here? What was wrong? And and often, usually the way this is taught is that he wasn't allowed to go into the promised land because he hit the rock and he should have spoken to the rock. Um, but that's not what the text says at all. Let's look at what the text says, because this is going to be very helpful. <clears throat> Numbers 20. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to defend my holiness in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this people into the land that I have promised them. Well, this is very interesting um, because it's not talking about hitting the rock, it's talking about defending his holiness. What's going on here? I ought to say I'm very much indebted to a, to a Jewish scholar who's done a lot of work in this area and does a superb job at comparing all the texts. And I'll put a link in the sermon notes to his material. Um, so what's, what's going on there? Well, if we look back at uh, Numbers 17, we find something very interesting. Moses had actually been given very explicit instructions what to do if this sort of thing happened. And God, that previously they'd had people grumbling and... Part of the way the grumbling was resolved is God had um, caused Aaron's rod to grow and turn into a bush um, because it, as, as a demonstration, supernatural demonstration that God was there, his presence and his power were there and he was supporting Moses and Aaron's leadership. And uh, so let's just look at this passage. Um, On the next day, Moses went into the tent of testimony and behold, the staff of Aaron for the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms and it bore ripe almonds. So this supernatural thing had happened to, to the, the, the staff of Aaron and it was, it was there as a sign of God's supernatural power that he was there. Uh, and the Lord said to Moses, put back the staff of Aaron before the testimony, that means before the ark, to be kept as a sign for the rebels that you may make an end of their grumblings against me. So in other words, it's a sign. And if ever they start grumbling, he's to get it out and show them and say, look, God is a supernatural God. He can do this sort of thing. So bear in mind, this is what he'd been told just three chapters earlier. And so what happens in Numbers 20? Um, actually, Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. So in verse 9, we have Moses doing exactly what he's told. He's got the staff again, as he'd been told to. But remember the next thing he's told to? He's told actually to speak to the people and to defend God's holiness. But he doesn't do that. Look at what happens. Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, God is a faithful God. He will not leave you dead to die in the wilderness. He's supernatural. Look at this rod. Look what he did with this. He just made this dry rod burst into life. Don't worry. He's going to look after you. He'll produce water. No, he didn't say that. He said, hear now, you rebels. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abundantly and the congregation drank and their livestock. In other words, he maybe didn't even trust what was God was going to do, but certainly he didn't uphold God's 
faithful commitment to them as a people. So the passage goes on. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to defend my holiness in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this people into the land that I promised them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them he showed himself holy. Well, this is just this is, this is a beautiful support for this message that I've been giving about what holiness is. Because God's holiness is him providing water for them, keeping them alive. And God showed himself to be holy by providing the water. But God was particularly upset because this actually wasn't just a one time. It was a pattern that Moses didn't defend God and point the people to God's faithfulness, but he just got angry with them. And so this made it really him unsuitable as somebody to lead the people into the promised land where a huge amount of faith in God and God's holiness, God's commitment would be required. I was so glad to, to read this, to discover this, because it made a lot, of more, a lot more sense to me of a passage which I'd found a little confusing up to this point in time. So the, 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 the failure of Moses was he should have proclaimed his faith in God and God's commitment to being faithful. And so um, I, I, I think that uh, this is a, a great example, and we're going to see later, of what it means for us to be holy, because it's to do with having trust in who God is and God's faithfulness. So that then was Moses' failure. Next, I would like to look at holy objects and places which is a difficult area, and there's a lot of stuff that you might find very confusing when you look in the Old Testament about these objects, these holy objects and holy places. And they will end up by looking at special possession. So, <clears throat> places. <clears throat> what about all the laws um, about... Um, uh, places which were like the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies. You know, only the high priest could go in once a year. If anyone else tried to go in there, they would die. And it was a special holy place. There was a mountain that couldn't be touched. Anybody who touched it would die. Uh, these places that were like special places that were declared to be holy, what's that about? How, can, how does that fit in with what we're talking about? And then... Uh, we have the idea of objects being holy. And, you know, even a bowl or a utensil could be holy. In fact, even fire from a particular source could be a holy source for that fire. There was a particular recipe for incense. They were only to use that recipe for incense for God because the recipe was holy. And to use a, an and when you came to worship God, if you used a regular bowl, not a holy one, just one of your own bowls, then God would be angry according to the laws. How is it important to distinguish between holy and unholy things? So the first thing we have to understand is that holiness and clean and unclean are actually different. Holiness is not the same as cleanness. So we have in the Old Testament, like, like clean foods, like, for example, chicken or beef would be clean, pork would be unclean. And there were a whole range of foods that were clean or unclean, and it all went, went through to you know, diseases, it went through to all kinds of things that were unclean or clean. You know, lizards were unclean, so if a, a lizard climbed on a bowl, then that bowl became unclean, you had to wash it, leave it till evening, so it would be clean, a lot of these rules. But it's important to understand that this distinction between clean and unclean is different to the distinction between holy and not holy. So what is the opposite to holy? Does anybody know? If the opposite to clean is unclean, 
What is the opposite to holy? Anyone tell me? It's, yeah, one of the words used is profane. I think a, a, a more descriptive word in our language is ordinary. Ordinary. It's just not, because something holy is dedicated to God. And if it's not holy, it could be clean, but it's just not used for that purpose. It's ordinary. And sometimes different translations use it differently. Uh, some people use, some tran older ones use the word profane, but that's a, a awkward translation because we now talk about profanities as something bad and that wasn't the idea um so some translations use the word common holy or common i think ordinary is a good way because there's nothing actually evil about something that's not holy it's just not being used for that purpose so you could have a bowl which you made your food in and so on and it's fine it's just an ordinary bowl but then a holy bowl can only be used for the offerings for god so I'm going to then give you these categories, holy or ordinary, and then clean or unclean. Um, so, so if something clean and something unclean touch, then the clean thing becomes unclean and has to be cleansed. Um, but um, the way that an unclean thing becomes clean, then it, it goes through the washing process. But for something ordinary to become holy, it has to be dedicated to God. So the priests would go through a process of, of them being dedicated to become holy. And of course, they couldn't be unclean. If they became unclean, they would have to be cleaned, cleansed, first of all. So holy mean, assumes already that it's clean. So uh, this is the, these are the categories. Now, I'm going to say these categories are only within the covenants at Sinai only within what we call the Old Covenant in the Scripture. Um, the categories of holy and ordinary are only within that. And now the strange thing is that even a source of fire could be holy or ordinary. You could just you know, get it from your own fire and it would be ordinary fire, or you could get it from the single flame burning in the temple. And this is, leads us up to the rather shocking story I'm going to read. Leviticus 10. Aaron's sons... Nadab and Abihu took their censers, which are things carrying incense, burning incense, and they offered unauthorized fire, in other words, ordinary fire, before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. This is kind of shocking. What on earth is going on here? Why is God killing these people? Because the fire that they used wasn't holy. It was just ordinary. Um, so the, I'm going to take some time on this answer because we're going to see it maps onto a bigger answer. Holy things and places. So this idea of these holy things like holy fire only occurs within the Old Covenant, which is the name the Bible gives to the covenant at Sinai, the covenant that Moses gave them in the wilderness that set up the whole sacrificial system. So, for example, when Abraham went to, to make an offering, he could dress how he wanted and use any fire. So there's nothing intrinsic about the nature of worshipping God that requires special fire or special clothes. No special clothes existed until the, the covenant came at Mount Sinai. You could just wear anything. You could do anything. Um, now, some of the the the, the, uh, the teaching about clean and unclean just began a little bit to come in. Then God began to give them some things, but it wasn't there wasn't the way it was at at, um, at Sinai. Um, but then, even at Mount Sinai, Moses seemed to be able to exist, step outside the covenant, go up on the mountain and see God face to face to him with no special preparation, no clothes, no, no, no religious ritual. He could just talk with God on the mountain, like face to face. The Bible says nobody ever saw God face to face the way that Moses did. And he did not do any special preparation for it. So what I'm saying is there's nothing intrinsic about God that he requires this special kind of way of approaching him. What was going on? So this is what I'm going to say. The Sinai Covenant, the Old Covenant, is an object lesson. It's a symbolic portrayal of what is needed to be done 
to reconcile humanity. So sin is is symbolically shown as um, like unclean things, and forgiveness is cleaning them. And then the idea of of coming before God is actually uh, the whole system was deliberately hard and imperfect because its job was to point forward to Jesus. Because when Jesus came, we were to see this is a much better way. This is just uh, Jesus has removed all of this stuff and given us an easy, clear access to God. Now, I've hugely simplified it here because there's a lot of stuff in the Old Covenant that, that has got a lot of symbolic value, all kinds of things happening. But in broad picture, the the problems that we have with holiness, holy objects and and uh, holy places are only linked to the covenant, the old covenant. Outside of the old covenant, uh, we don't have that. And the old covenant was almost like an artificially symbolic system in order to teach a lesson. And it was deliberately hard and imperfect So, because its job was to point forward to Jesus. Now, you'll probably say, isn't this a bit unfair to Aha, to, to uh, Nadab and Abihu that they got killed for this? Well, they they've been very carefully explained to them what they what they should do, and they deliberately just short took a shortcut and didn't bother to follow the commands. And really, God was saying, "Look, you have to take this seriously. Like this is ext- I'm extremely committed to this covenant. This is like life and death. You have to take this seriously." And this is why it happened. Just as a very quick explanation. It was an extreme lack of respect, really, to God for doing this. Um, so I could talk more about this, but I want to move on at this point. Um, so holy things and places uh, totally devoted to God were only in this old covenant system. They were an object lesson. And Jesus, when he was speaking to the woman of Samaria, said that holy places would be obsolete. He was about worshiping God in spirit and in truth. They were the places were becoming obsolete. But there is a really important thing we can learn from these object lessons, and that's the idea of holiness being connected to particular objects, possessions, which are, and it is to do with possession of that. That a holy object was belonged to God, and I'm going to explain this in our third section. So we've looked at the source of the confusion, Moses' failure to, to, to proclaim God's holiness by defending him, um, holy objects and places and how they're linked to the old covenant. And now this idea of linking holiness to possession, something that's holy being owned, being a special possession. So the, what a good place for beginning to teach this would be Exodus 19, where it says, speaking of the nation of Israel, God says, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. You shall be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And we see many times holiness, having the idea, if it's holiness of people, or things or places as something that belongs to God as his special possession. <clears throat> so, um, the the first time the word holy is used in the Bible, apart from a, a, a little refer- passing reference uh, to the Sabbath in the creation narrative, the first place it's used is actually <clears throat> when Moses sees the burning bush. And so let's look at this, because this is going to be very helpful in understanding where we're going. Uh, When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, so Moses is there, he sees this bush that doesn't stop burning, not consumed. He turns aside to see it. And God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Well, isn't this interesting? What's going on here? It's okay for Moses' smelly feet to be touching the ground, but not his sandals. What is it that's happening here? Well, um, 
it, it, it turns out that in that culture, that, that, sh that shoes or sandals are connected with a, a symbol of ownership. I could prove this to you by looking at other scriptures, um, but there's not time now. You just have to take my word for it. Like the, the sandals are linked to ownership. And when you went into someone's home, you'd ex be expected to remove your shoes, not as in Canada, because they may be covered in snow, but um, not because your feet were cleaner. Your feet could be dirty and smelly, but to acknowledge that that space belonged to the person. So taking them off acknowledges the space belonging to the person. So what that means was God is saying to Moses, this is my space. I need you to acknowledge this. He doesn't he keep away at all? He's never told not to come onto this ground. And it looks like that the holy, holy places are actually created by God for the purpose of connecting with us. Um, so holy simply means that it belongs to God. It's his space. It belongs to him. And actually, this is true. We'll see. You can see if you study it to all places or object or people that is ascribed as being holy. It turns out to be a very good way of pulling together a lot of the stuff that I've been saying in the last two sermons. <laughs> and we can pull it together and wrap it up with this idea. And there's one more key idea that I want to add to this, as well as holiness being about possession, it's also about possession for a purpose. And we'll see that this, this idea is key to pulling everything together. So I'm going to move now towards trying to, to relate this to us. Our holiness. For us to be holy is to be God's treasured possession. So I'm taking that from the, uh, the verse that we had earlier, that we are his treasured possession. But we belong to him for a purpose, and that is to reflect his goodness and love to the universe. I say the universe because it's not just this world it's the angelic world as well. And uh, the purpose that we have, the purpose for um, us carrying his holiness is to do this. And so this, I'm going to say, I'm going to argue, adds another dimension to holiness. Uh, so let's look a little bit more then about our holiness. Our holiness is 100% commitment to God. I said that last time. That's how I drew things to a conclusion last time. Uh, and so I'd like to add to it now the statement that this means commitment to the role he's given to us. So when we say we're 100% committed to God, it's not just like in an abstract way. We're committed to a task that he's given us. And this role is showing the core aspects of his character, which are his holiness. That is his faithful love and his truth to the universe. So when it says that we are holy, we are God's treasured people, his special possession, then we are carrying, we're carrying his holiness. What that means is like we need to be showing forth this aspect of God. We need to be carrying God's holiness. We need to having this, these amazing characteristics that we defined as God's holiness, this faithfulness, this faithful love, this commitment to, to, uh, to helping, to being merciful, all of those good things. Our holiness is connected with showing that out as a role. And because of this, it will make demands on our life. Because this is the role it will make our demands on our lives. Now, this is going to enable us to build a bridge from the Old Testament concept of holiness to the way it's developed in the New Testament. Um, and this sets us up for the third and final sermon on holiness that I will look at next time. And I'm going to 
give you, uh, I'm going to unpack what I've been talking about on this last slide um, in, a, in, a, in a more developed way to show how purpose is connected to holiness. And then I'm going to look at the Holy Spirit and how holy defines the Spirit in the way he operates with us and uh, just some beautiful verses that connect that together and see the description of the Holy Spirit is exactly the same as the description for God in the Old Testament. And we're going to end our next message by looking at some key New Testament passages that beautifully tie these things together. And this also connects to what it means to become a Christian, because after becoming a Christian is not just simply about, oh, I need to get my sins forgiven, let's ask Jesus to forgive them. Now, of course, that is vitally important, but it's, it's about um, making Jesus your Lord, giving your life to him, and uh, Jesus uh, gives you a new mandate, a new role, which is carrying his holiness. And so you lose a commitment to yourself, but you gain a commitment to Jesus, which has got a far higher destiny to it. So I want to try and sum this up on my last slide. And I've expanded slightly from last time's last slide. So be holy, be passionately dedicated and 100% committed to God. God is 100% committed to you. So be 100% committed to him. So that's how I ended up last time. And here is my extra line from this week. The world learns about God by watching you. So pay attention to what your life is communicating. See, you are a God's possession. You're his special treasured possession if you're a Christian. And being holy, you are you are holy for a purpose. And the purpose that he's chosen you for is to reflect his holiness to this universe, to the world and to everything outside the world. What does this mean? What this means is, is showing the same kind of love that God shows when he's holy. It means showing that, that love that is totally faithful to the end. That love which is love at its, even though there's a great cost in it. It's a love that cares for those who no one else cares for, who is, has compassion. That a love which um, sometimes is, is abused, sometimes goes um, unthanked. But God's love surpasses that. And so when we are holy, it's not just that we are committed to him. We're committed to him for a purpose. And this purpose is to reflect him to this world. So I hope next time to pull all of these things together with something that really clearly shows us how we are called to do this in our lives. So let's come to God in prayer, shall we? Thank you, Father, for the amazing commitment you have to us. Thank you, Father, for the faithful love that will never let us go, that has us for eternity. Even though we fall, we mess up, we sin, yet you are faithful. Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, we pray that this same character will shine from us and we'll be committed completely to showing this to the world around us, around us that so desperately needs this message. Lord, we cry to you, fill us with your holiness. In Jesus' name, amen.